All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome once again, or maybe for the first time, to the Spokane Dream Center Sunday School. My name is Josh Maltzberger. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here this morning with all of you, freely coming together to pursue intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the reading of his word, through worship, through fellowship. So good to just stand up here and get that perspective, see all of you conversing with one another. Hopefully the, uh, the center of your conversations being uh, his goodness, his grace and the opportunity that we have here. It's uh, truly a blessing and uh, just very grateful this morning as I went back and gave Fred a hug. You know, uh, we always embrace and just, and how are you? How are things going? Why? Because we care, you know? It's very easy to go through life and, oh, how's it going? Oh, good, 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 good. But you know what? There's a difference when you're in and amongst believers who you know care, that are willing to go the next step and actually listen to what you have to say Consider what you have to say. Be prayerful about your situation, your circumstances, where you're at in life. And so it's a blessing to be able to have people like that in your lives within the body of Christ. And when he asked me how I was doing, you know, I said that I am, I'm rich. I'm rich. I've got an acronym this morning for you. If you've anybody ever heard of, of GRACE, what the acronym is for GRACE. Good. Then I get, everybody gets to learn something new today. You get to leave the class going, I learned something new. It wasn't just the same old thing. I learned something new today. <laughs> so, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. And when you consider how rich you are spiritually, heir of the kingdom, a co-heir with Christ, heir of the kingdom that's coming. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem right if you consider me, my failures, my shortcomings, my transgressions, my sin. It's not right. But it's at his expense. All of that inheritance, all that I have spiritually, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is mine, is yours. But it cost God everything. It's at Christ's expense. He gave up everything. So in like manner, in like manner, with him as our example, him as our type, him as our Lord, I'm called, you're called, to live a life of service, sacrifice, pouring yourself out for the benefit of others, the way he did. And so we have Paul, we've been studying the book of Titus, we've been studying, you know, Paul's instruction to Titus in the furthering of the kingdom, the setting up of, you know, the, the further proclamation of the gospel in Crete, and setting up the elders within the church, and then giving instruction to the men, the older men, the older women, the younger men, the younger women, the bond slaves we're going to talk a little bit about today, and then we're going to go down, you know, into... This amazing grace and this stewardship that we have. It is so important. I'll tell you in these days that we are in now, with the darkness being so dark, so wicked, so awful, you can sit and complain and all you want. But our that's that the word doesn't tell us to do that. The word tells us to draw close to him, he'll draw closer still to us. We're to shine his light. We're ambassadors for Christ. We carry his character, his person in us to the world around us. And we should be peculiar, should be different. Not weird, like... <laughs> anyway, we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful, so honored, so thankful. Lord, to be in a place, Lord, where there has been such a work of God in the Spokane Dream Center. Such a deep and thorough and wide work that you have done. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in this place. Through leadership, through elders, through us as individuals, through the discipleships, through the outgoing ministries that, that are so many faithful men and women are a part of. God, and you've united us, Lord, for 
a time, a time like this. This particular time is where we are at. And you have works which you have pre-planned pre before the foundation of the world that I should walk in them and that we should walk in them as the body of Christ. There's a, a drama that is, you know, coming up. There's a story to be told. There's workplaces to be gone into. There's families to be restored. There are all these miracles that are waiting to happen. God, if we are just obedient and faithful to you, you will do it. You will accomplish it. You are not finished, Lord, with Spokane. You're not finished with the United States. You're not finished with the world. You are long-suffering and you are patient with us. It's your desire that none should perish and you are holding back your judgment, giving people every opportunity to repent of their sins and put their faith and their trust in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, we want to be found faithful as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that when you return and we have hopefully have oil in our lamp and we've taken our talents and we've done something with them. God, hopefully we have something to show you. We're ready, we're waiting, we're prepared, and we have something to show you upon your return. God, it's my desire that each and every soul in this place would get that realization, that revelation, Lord, that you have called them unto your service. We call you master. We call you Lord. As we study your word and consider slaves and masters and how those things can be taken and ran with and abused, Lord God, it doesn't negate the fact that there is authority within the world. And that's a God-ordained authority. Anyway, this morning, Lord, we just love you. We honor you. We pray for your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we've been in the book of Titus. You know, I, I'll tell you this morning, I don't know if I'm going to, as I always struggle with getting to everything, that every place in the word and how it all ties together and if you're, if you're like me and that's something that makes you come to life, the, uh, the interconnected, and interconnectedness of the, of the Word of God and how it confirms and reaffirms itself, right, to give greater depth of revelation to us, greater understanding and greater depth, it blows my mind and it, it's like a treasure hunt. You just want to keep searching, keep going, keep letting the Holy Spirit reveal these things to you. But then when you get up here and try to express all of those things, you fall miserably short. And so I apologize for that because I cannot do God's word justice. But his Holy Spirit can get the things that need to be heard to the people out that you're speaking to. So trust him in that. But I would encourage you this morning. This morning I read through all of Matthew 25. I think there's a, a definite connection between Matthew 25. I just prayed part of it. Right? Matthew 25 at, we're all familiar. Anybody heard a message about Matthew 24 lately in the last couple of years? Yeah, you have. You just might not remember somebody pointing you to it. But it's all the signs and the themes that are going to happen. It's the asking of Jesus, what should we look for? These are the themes that are going to precede his, his return. And so that's heavily talked about. But 25, right after that, right, is in light of that, hey, Jesus gives this example of the ten virgins. He gives the parable of the ten virgins. And then he talks about the talents. And the three men that got ten talents, five talents, you know, and he, and he goes, or five and, and three and, and one. And then the response. So it, it has all, everything to do with the oil in your lamp, keeping your oil full and your, your wick trimmed is dependent upon you continually filling there's an element of us. We think that the oil is emblematic of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and I want him, like Paul said, pray, be filled with the Spirit. Be being filled, right, with the Spirit. Continually pray. Lord, fill me. Fill me again. Fill me anew. I know I'm sealed. I know I'm filled. But you can pour out and pour in and through me. Continue to pour all of your goodness, all of your truth, all of your life into me. I need to be cleansed. I need to be purified. I need you. Of course, there's a work of God in the filling of the lamp, the oil in the lamp, but it's, it's, there is a, a reward and a, and a consequence for the women 
they there was an element of their responsibility to keep their lamps full of oil which means that it's on me too to pursue him if i stop reading my word if i stop pursuing him and i just pray oh fill me fill me fill me but i don't want to discipline my life i don't want to spend time in prayer i don't want to read your word i don't want to fellowship with other believers i just want to i just want you to fill me and then keep working with me on this sin that i kind of you know kind of want to get rid of but not you can deceive yourselves don't deceive yourselves you're, it is up to you and up to me to pursue him, to be ready for him. He could return at any time. That, that betrothed, that betrothed, that is as good as married, right? In that, in that time, in that place, you're, you're as good as married, but she's waiting. She is waiting for the groom to return. And you're part of the, the party and you're waiting for him to return. But there's a, it's an active waiting. There's a hope. At the end of Titus here, as we, as we go through here, you know, he's going, he's going to say um, in verse 13, awaiting and looking for the fulfillment, the realization of our blessed hope, even the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Here he comes with the shout of the archangel, right, with the trump. When he, are you, are you ready? Am I ready? If I wake up, what am I given to? Where's my mind at? Where's my heart at? What are my actions? What do the people around me see me doing? What am I given to? What type of example, what type of pattern am I showing people? So much of this book, Titus, talks about the things that we are called to do. We talked about it the last previous weeks. This is the doings of the believer how we're to carry ourselves and we are to be not we're to hold to sound doctrine that impacts affects and instructs us into faithful obedient walking walking it out walking righteously because your life your life and the character and the pattern of your life speaks volumes in a world that has so many voices so much false talk In a world where I can open up my phone and watch somebody but not know if it's an AI instructed, you know, presentation of somebody. I don't even know if what I can believe looking at that, just listening to that. But the more that you carry yourself in the power under the submission of Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, not perfectly. But if you can walk blamelessly before him, you present a testimony to the world, a witness to the world around you of the authenticity of Christ being Lord. He is Lord. And you can show it with your life. You can show it with your countenance. You can show it with your actions, with your service. And we're called to. So we've been talking about the older men, the aged, the gray beards. And something that you see throughout, if you go back and read it, Older men, women, younger men, that, that, be sober, 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 sober. Through all of them. It's repeated through all of them. Not just, and I, and it does consist of drunkenness. Of course, that is part of it. Don't be drunk with wine, right? But be ever filled with the spirit, Paul says. That's what we talked about earlier. So yes, there is certainly an element of drinking to the point of drunkenness and that not being consistent with the life of a believer but being sober has also the connotations of being vigilant right i'm not i I, i'm being very aware of what's going on i'm aware of my relationship with god i'm aware of my responsibilities as his follower as his son i'm aware of the world around me and the things that are going on And I'm going to utilize his word to instruct me how to navigate through this life. Be sober. You can't do that. And you can be drunk with a lot of things. Not just wine. Right? How many of you know that? Pastor Myrna Myrna would say, how many of you know? Right? How many of you know? You know. You and I both know. We've been there. We've done that. We've engaged in that. And we're called not to. We're called to be sober. So,
let's start. Let's let's just hang out in chapter two here a little bit. We'll finish this up. It says urge in verse two, urge the older men to be temperate, venerable, serious, sensible, self-controlled, and sound in the faith, in the love, and in the steadfastness and patience of Christ. Sensible, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, sound in the faith, in the love, and in the steadfastness and patience of Christ. Again, it's not according to the world. Everything has to be viewed through the lens of Christ. So you need to continue reading the Gospels, putting the Gospels on display, because he is our example. Now we see it, you know, we see it in men. We see people who are serious about following Jesus, but he is our example. That patience, see, it, it, the, the level of love, the level of patience is not to be equated with the level that a man in his natural strength can walk in. It's greater than that. It's the power of God that enables something supernatural in those areas. It's incredible. Okay. And there's something about seriousness right that that in the amplified that just says venerable or serious and i i like i'm not ta- i'm not saying you can never joke you know i like to joke i like to have a good time i but there's a time and there's a place for everything and there's a way to do things without being you know distasteful or certainly uh evil or gross or perverted or anything of that nature um but there's also a tendency to keep men <laughs> acting like boys. Not serious. Everything's a tee hee hee funny. Tee hee hee. Everything's funny. And that's not actually the way that we're called to live. There's a serious like there look, yes, there's humor, there's there's things that are funny, but people the the sobering thing is that your neighbor who is engaged in all of that wickedness is unrepentant doesn't trust christ for salvation if christ comes back tomorrow where's he going to be so you better not just feel like oh let's just go let's just let's engage let's let's continue you know carrying on in a way that's leading you straight to hell there's a seriousness that we're supposed to carry you know jesus was very serious (laughs) serious <laughs> he's also very loving very loving very approachable like serious doesn't mean stern and unapproachable serious means just that serious it says bid the older women similarly similarly to be reverent and devout in their deportment as becomes those engaged in sacred service not slanderers or slaves to drink They are to give good counsel and be teachers of what is right and noble so that they will wisely train the young women to be sane and sober of mind, temperate, disciplined, and to love their husbands and their children. And I'll tell you, you know, I know this is part by way of review. We we went over this, but I'll tell you, there's another element of element of this, which the church, not necessarily our church, but some of the church might be missing and it's and it is basically that how much like there is certainly a place for women for for women old and young to be given to doctrine the instruction and the learning of the word the learning of the word and being renewed in their mind and being set on the rock and learning and being educated by the word is for male and female but also what it says in here in chapter two is that the older women through the way that they carry themselves the way the character that they have and the way that they devote themselves to christ that they will be wisely training the young women to be sane and sober of mind temperate disciplined to love their husbands and their children how much ministry is given to women from women about instructing them how to love their husbands and their children. And I would just say, I think there's a a lack of that, especially in a culture and a society that is feminist in nature and wants to blend, you know, genders and everything else and roles and responsibilities and all of these things and would make less of you if you were just to love 
and honor your husband and love your kids and sacrifice of yourself for them because love remember definitionally through the gospel of christ with looking at jesus is selfless is sacrificial and is unconditional but if you operate in that as a woman to your husband and to your kids right the world and even within the church might go man you're you're missing it you're missing the mark you don't have to deal with that you don't have to work with that it's this it's that they have a different definition of love they have a different de definition of roles and responsibilities so through your life and through it's important the picture of 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 husband and wife is a picture of jesus and his body it is it is it's huge it's from the it's from the beginning it's designed to put on display his wisdom and his love and his care and those roles in marriage anyway that's we're not going to go deep into all of that but it's it's not maybe not taught enough but should be and so titus is instructed to teach them to teach the older women so that they would teach the younger women To be self-controlled, chaste, homemakers, good-natured, kind-hearted, adapting and subordinating themselves to their husbands, that the word of God may not be exposed to reproach, that is, blasphemed or discredited. In a similar way, urge the younger men to be self-restrained and behave prudently, taking life seriously, which I just talked about, and show your own self in all respects to be a pattern and a model of good deeds and works. Teaching what is unadulterated, showing gravity, having the strictest regard for truth and purity of motive with dignity and seriousness. That word for pattern is tupas, something like that. It's where we get the, uh, the word for type, a type or pattern, a model of good deeds and works. Again, it's, it's not what just what you say it's how you live you're teaching through your words and through your actions teaching what is unadulterated showing gravity again seriousness having the strictest regard for truth and purity of motive which is obviously if you read the gospels christ rails against just the works that people that men do and relying on those works he always gets down to the motives the motivation behind our works with dignity and seriousness. Again, serious again. And let your instruction be sound and fit and wise and wholesome, vigorous and irrefutable and above censure so that the opponent may be put to shame, finding nothing discrediting or evil to say about us. There is an element of what Titus is being charged to do by Paul. It's one, to institute sound doctrine within the church. It's also to appoint leadership within the church based off of the qualifications that are prescribed by God, the Holy Spirit, through Paul. So there's the, there, those are two of the things that he's doing. But part of this sound doctrine, part of this teaching, is a refutation of those who would come against the word of God that would come against the word of God and say, no, that's not right. This is a better way. This is a truer way. That's not the truth. This is the truth. And so Titus, and I believe we as well, have this, ro have this role to be able to be serious enough about the word of God, to study the word of God enough to where we are able lovingly, graciously, to give an account for the hope that we have within us and to be, you know, to refute that which is false. Now you see people politically do this. You see a, a Charlie Kirk and you see, you know, different people that, that stand up and they utilize their, their intelligence on particular matters to show this is why this makes more sense. And that doesn't make sense. Right. But spiritually, scripturally, we need to be able to take the word of God, divide it well, and show people the way in which they're wrong. And it doesn't, that, that doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good and it's challenging. I've got to go tell that person the way in which they're wrong. You know, I had a, uh, at the store, 
See, because I'm in management, I get to do this all the time. <laughs> and it is, it's, it's not easy though, because you care about people. You don't want them to take offense and leave, and then you're short people, and you don't want to come across as too harsh or strict. But there's rules, and there's policies, and there's things like that. So when I walk through my office, and I look, and I see on the screen, and then there's the cashier who is, you know, texting away while there's nobody at the, at the till, what do I do? Turn a blind eye, let it go, right? Or do I show her the way in which she is acting and behaving wrong by grabbing the phone, calling up to the front register without her knowing that it's me, going, oh, hey, hello, how are you doing? This is Josh, who are you talking to? Oh, oh, yes, please get back to work, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy, it's not easy. For those in leadership, if you've had any type of leadership role, and if you're a parent, you're in a leadership role. So it's not like you just have to be managing something. You're managing your own home, right? There's levels of authority just within life. And so that that stewarding that role for the betterment of whoever's above you and for the betterment of the person who is, you know, beneath you in that sense, not truly beneath you, but authority-wise, of course. It, it, those are those are challenging things, but they're necessary things, and and even spiritually, we don't want to have you don't want to be a coward. And one thing that can lead to cowardice is a incomplete, and all of us have some level of incomplete, but a but a a lack of knowledge of the Word of God and the core tenets within it. If you don't pursue those things and, and at least pursue God instructing you what are some I want to have some of the answers then when you are confronted and you're confronted by somebody who's teaching error or completely false doctrine or whatever it else you may be a, a coward because you don't know the foundation on which you're standing on so get to know the word you know get to know the word continually understand and know the character of God, the precepts, the commandments, all every, everything that he has. Um, and you're not going to learn it overnight. So don't be discouraged. Just keep walking. The thing that you know, see, God is so wise in what he's doing. He knows what you know. He knows what you don't know. He knows what you need to know. So it's a relationship. He's going to keep instructing you. He's not out for your destruction. He doesn't want you to be a coward. He's not out there to try to test you to have you fail. So it's, it's okay. If I don't know everything there is to know about this book, and I don't, it's also okay if somebody comes up, learn to say this, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know, give me some time to find an answer for you. I have had to say that many times, many times. But then, go and actually do it. Don't just say, I don't know, and then let it go away, and then move on. Go and do it. Go and pursue that answer. Pursue that truth. And ask God to reveal it to you, the Holy Spirit, because he's so faithful. He's faithful to do it. Okay. Verse 9. Tell bond servants to be submissive to their masters, to be pleasing and give satisfaction in every way, Warn them not to talk back or contradict. Now, could you see where somebody, okay, this is, this is maybe a good example of what I just talked about. Somebody comes to you and says, doesn't the Bible say to tell bond servants to be submissive to their masters, to be pleasing and give satisfaction in every way? Warn them not to talk back or contradict. Doesn't the Bible say that that's what the slaves are supposed to do to their masters? The Bible condones slavery. Do you have an answer for that? If you don't, keep studying God's word. Keep understanding God's full word on the idea of slavery, what it was back then, what it looks like now, where he stands in the middle of it, why he doesn't have an exact refutation for slavery, because he wasn't dealing with the slave trade 
that happened and the stealing of people. He wasn't dealing with that. When he did deal with that in the Old Testament, there was harsh repercussions for those who would steal anybody. That's not, that was not according to the law. You couldn't just do that. There's all sorts of Old Testament and New Testament understanding to give a refutation for somebody pulling one verse out of context and going, see, that's what it means. Just because somebody says that's what it means doesn't mean that's what it means. You, right, as a student, you as a follower of Christ, should care a lot about doctrine. You should care about that person and their misconception on slavery enough to pursue it to where you can give an answer. Now, that's not what we're doing this morning. That's not what I studied this morning to do, to tell you all about what God says about slavery. Maybe we'll do that someday. But I don't think it's necessary because I think most everybody in here has read most of or a good portion of the word of God. They understand the character of God and that the culture and the society that surrounds us that we find ourselves in and the way that it changes is through individuals changing by the kingdom of God being shed inside of their heart accepting Jesus as Lord, seeing the way he cared about people, he served people, he loved people, and then going out and that, through the implementation of that, and they see the whole word of God that everybody's created in his image and his likeness, so there is nobody who's inferior just because of their color or or the man or woman. Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free in Christ. the, The cross brings us all to nothing. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one, I am not superior to anybody. There is nobody superior to me, right? Because you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in Christ, we are one body. So the the gospel changes everything. So none of us have have the right to go and enslave against the will anybody, right? But if I look at this, what I see what's applicable to today to today now there is slavery and there is like that but see isn't the church railing against and fighting against the the sexual you know trade the sexual industry who's at the forefront of that christians are because they recognize it as absolutely wrong absolutely wrong so there's anyway we're not going to go we're not going to continue to go down here because I will, I will just give you every explanation. But what I see, what's more applicable to today, is what I just talked about. Which is, instead of slaves and masters, and, and understanding that over half of the Roman Empire at that time was slaves. It was, it, it was the economy that they had. It was the situation that they had. In the midst of that, of course, the, the gospel changes culture. But ultimately, we look forward to the appearing of Jesus Christ and all of culture, every form of it, good and bad, bowing at the feet of the culture of the kingdom that's coming. It's his culture, it's his, it's his kingdom that we look forward to. And in the midst of it, yes, we want to see his kingdom come here and now. And we want things to change. And we want things to look more like that. But ultimately, we also realize that this is a broken world. It's not going to get it all right before he comes back. It's going to get it all wrong. But we're here to preserve and protect and pull out as many people in the process as we can. So, what I see is employee, right? And manager. That's manager or owner. These, these, this type of relationship, and you can adorn, you can wear, you can carry Christ and his grace through whatever job. I don't care if you got minimum wage, less than minimum wage, you're working under the table and you shouldn't be. I don't care, you know, you're making 75, 95,000 a year. Whatever you're doing, if you are adorning grace, you can do that through not talking back to your manager to your owner, to the to your superior in authority above you. Doesn't make him better or worse. He could be a way worse sinner. I've had bosses that were, you know, I don't know. Let's just say, yeah, they're at least as bad as me. I know that much. Right? Doesn't make him any better. 
But because I understand authority and I understand Christ and his descension and his willingness to be obedient and the things that he endured through his obedience to the Father, then who am I to say, well, he doesn't have the right to say that to me. He doesn't have the right to tell me to do that. He's, he's instructed me to do five things, and that person is over there, you know, taking 16, you know, potty breaks. This isn't fair. This isn't right. This is, what are you doing, you know? And I'm going to make sure he knows about it. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk back to him and get, let him know. Just don't do it. Now, everything. So when you read scripturally, here's another thing to, to understand. When it says, slaves, be obedient to your masters. Husband or wives, obey your husbands, right? Later, after this, it's going to say, uh, in, in chapter 3, remind people to be submissive to their magistrates and authorities, to be obedient, to be prepared and willing to do any upright and honorable work. What does it not say? To be willing and ready to do any unhonorable work for the government and the magistrates that are above you. See, there's God's law, right? And his authority and his instructions. And then there's in the instructions of man and the authority that exists in the realm that we live in. So if you, if you are, you are a part of that. If you're in the programs, you understand. If you're not in the programs, you understand. You have a boss, right? You have, you have the government, you have a police officer, you know, tailing you with the lights on, right? There is, there is authority and I'm called to pull over. But, and that's why it's so important to learn this. It's so important. Because the more you know and understand, why do you think there is such a fight against abortion? Right? Aren't we supposed to just be obedient to the law of the land and the things that are going on? It, does, it tells us here, be ready to be prepared to be obedient to the magistrates, right? Yes. But if it's unbiblical, unethical, ungodly, guess who I'm going to be obedient to? God, God's word. And I don't care if you mock me, ridicule me, persecute me, throw me in prison, or kill me. Or kill me. If I know and I'm convinced that God says this and you say that, guess who I'm picking? That's what, that's what the apostles did when they told them to quit proclaiming Jesus. They, they jailed them. They, they said, stop talking about Jesus. It says, whether it's right to you, I don't know. But I know what's right to God. We've been instructed. We've been commanded. Go make disciples of all the nations, right? They were obedient to Christ's command versus the spirit, even the spiritual authorities at that time. I'm going to be obedient to Christ. So, understanding authority is huge. It will change and transform your life, your obedience, and your eternity. The, I mean, it will transform your eternity because it has everything to do with fruit bearing. It has everything to do with storing up treasure in heaven. See, you can trust for the forgiveness of your sins. You can be rich in forgiveness. You can be absolutely forgiven of your sin, but you could not understand authority. You could go out into the world with, a, with a, that type of mindset, and you are not adorning, you are not carrying the grace of God in Christ around you as, you as you navigate life. If you do so, you are changing, you're impacting, you're witnessing to people. That matters eternally and is stored up eternally for you. If you disregard that, choose not to do that, right? That's a, you're missing out. That's what I'm saying. I don't want you to miss out. I don't want to miss out right due to my negligence or disobedience of understanding authority so don't get into long discussions about slavery with people that just want to contradict the word of god it it is it is exhausting <laughs> it, is, it is exhausting and oftentimes you just will not be able to convince somebody so move along you know jesus went places he ministered. He was who he was. He did what he did. He ministered the truth. He is the truth, right? He didn't just stick around forever trying to convince somebody. We make Sometimes we make errors in doing that. I'm not saying don't love somebody, continue to love somebody, continue to minister as the Spirit leads. But 
I could spend the next 20 years trying to get some Mormon to come out of the cult that they're in and be completely missing everybody else that is needs the gospel. I'm not saying that God, sometimes it's a matter of trusting God. I sowed the seed, God. You know my heart. I was obedient to you. I did what I needed to do. Do you want me to stay? That's why it's a relationship. Do you want me to stay and continue here? Or is it time to move on? Oftentimes, Jesus was in relationship with the Father. He did what the Father said. He was instructed by the Father. Do I stay another day in Capernaum? Or where are we going? Sometimes it's time to go. I'm not talking about leaving the program. Just so everybody, like, just not what I'm talking about. God called you to a one-year program. God was wise in his decision. He designed a one-year program or more or whatever it takes, whatever it is, be obedient to, just stay at least here. Just do that for me. Do that for me. Okay? Let God do a thorough work. Even if you know better than God, just trust that God knows better than you. And don't just do it once. Do that about like 10 times a day, at least. <laughs> okay. A pattern. You know, there's a, there's a lot to be said when he, when he says that you, Titus, be a pattern, right? Be a pattern for others. You can go to Exodus 25 and uh, verses 9 and 40 where God instructs Moses. He says, make sure you make everything according to pattern. And then it's reiterated in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Do you remember when, Mo, you know, when God, the Father, told Moses? Is that there's this pattern of the tabernacle. There's something about really, under like, get the, the point is, people are watching you. See, Moses was shown the pattern, right? He was shown the pattern, and then he was expected to make it according to the pattern. So, come expecting, come intentional, and look at the pattern. You, he had to look at that pattern pretty, pretty solidly to get it. You know, the, the drama is called Behold Jesus. That Behold Jesus, Behold, when John talks about that, right? That is to strongly fix your gaze upon Jesus. Behold Jesus. Behold, the who's the pattern? Sunday school answer. Who's the pattern? Amen. Okay, right. Very good. Jesus is the pattern. The tabernacle was the pattern that pointed to the pattern. Does that make sense? Jesus. Because there's elements within the tabernacle that all point to Jesus, right? Jesus is our example. We learn, we learn of him. And in a way, you are not Jesus with a little J, of course, all those things. That is true. But you are his son. You do carry Christ. You are his ambassador. And you are to be a pattern. You aren't the perfect pattern. None of us is. So we can't be arrogant. He's going to talk about arrogance, you know, of course. But it's true. That is quite the responsibility to be a pattern. You don't want to have a loose bolt somewhere where if somebody tries to build the way you're building, everything goes down. Okay? So be sober. Be vigilant. Be serious. Be Right? All the things, all that instruction. Have to actually do it. Have to actually do it. Okay. Closing up. We're over, over time here. And I know we didn't make it through chapter 3. But I'd encourage you to read it, you know, in your own time. Also, in, in correlation to this, and maybe we'll finish with this. We'll just read it, and then we will be done. Because when we talk about the pattern, we talk about being obedient. Oh, being obedient to your master in the workplace. And we didn't go over all, all of what that looks to, like, but just because I know some of you have set aside a season of your life where you're not out there working for somebody, get, you know, getting money in that sense, but you are working for him. Understand you're working for him daily. You need to be intentional about that. And when you go out there, what's stealing? It says don't, you know, it says not, uh, not pilfering or, or whatever it is. What it means is don't steal. <laughs> Slaves, don't steal from your masters. Employees, don't steal from your employers. And that, see, that example of somebody, you know, doing this, what is she stealing? Time. She's stealing time, right? Now, all of us have done it. I didn't fire her on the spot, right? 
there's mercy and there's grace, but there is truth and there is correction that has to happen. It's a, it's a, how do you navigate that, right? Well, God will show you. But if you continue to steal time, eventually I will find somebody who's not going to steal the time. That's going to actually maximize the, the time that I give here. So, isn't it amazing how the gospel doesn't just affect your salvation, it affects your workplace. It affects your role within the workplace. It affects your role within your family. It affects your role. It affects everything. It's a biblical lens. It's a biblical worldview that we want to get to know and understand. Heavenly Father, I because we're over time, we're just going to encourage people to go read Philippians chapter 2. Lord, that we might truly see your servanthood, your submission to the Father, your sacrifice in becoming a man, the eternal God. You know, uh, we just, it, it leaves you speechless because none of us can even express to the best of our ability. We could try and try, we could all try, and it would still fall short of what that looked like for you to come to Bethlehem to be born of a virgin, to be helpless, and then to grow, to be spat upon, ridiculed, rejected, while, while, while sinless and loving and on a redemption journey. Lord, we have no idea what the dissension really cost or really, really looked like, but would you give us enough revelation to where we can understand and apply that to our own lives, to where we can go, because he's my Lord, because I, I understand this much of what he's done, I know what I'm called to do, and my life doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. Father, help us to live in love with you as our type, you as our pattern, you as our guide, Lord, revealing that to us and empowering us to walk in it daily. Father, that we might not be ashamed at your coming. And truly, Lord, we encourage one another in the fact that you are coming, Lord. Uh, Anyway, we love you so much, Jesus. As we go down, just let the meditations of our heart, the thoughts in our mind, the words that come out of our mouth, Lord, just be edifying, uplifting, honoring, pleasing to you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen.